Welcome, church. We stand with us. Let's see. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love.
Thank you for coming close through your son, Jesus. We just declare this truth. And I will not be anxious. Oh, Jesus, you are near. The peace of God surrounding me. Casting out all fear.
Sometimes I sing this song and I just, I can't get it off my mind today. Maybe we can sing this together. And tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to the same. Sometimes maybe not in our understanding or maybe not in our timing, but you've already won. Thank you for that. I pray we would be a people that would walk in it, that we remember the gospel today and the gravity of it, the power of it. Lord, I just pray against the spirit of condemnation today. That no one in the sound of my voice would be held up by this ugly enemy of condemnation. I thank you for these moments, Lord. You are good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. My first year at camp, I was sitting in the services and I heard everybody talking about camp. There were multiple announcements and I kept telling myself, wow, that really sounds fun. I think that would be something I would be interested in, but I'm gonna do that next year. I then got a call from Hannah who explained to me that she was the camp director and that she was looking for a nurse to come as a part of the medical team. And I just thought to myself, how did you even find me? I've only been going to this church for like six months. I was fairly new to Midland, and she knew I was a nurse, and I just thought, okay, there's a reason that she's found me. During the time of, you know, camp, all the stories were coming up on the video, it's like that little seed was planted in my mind, and I thought, no, no, it's not for me. Um, but then again, when I was praying and reading, you know, doing the experience in God, it's like it, it once again came to my mind. It, and I'm driving back from Midland, and then I start thinking about church camp again. I told myself, okay, I'm gonna, if this is for me, then I'm going to talk to Kara, the lady at Stonegate. So she said, well, this spot, this spot, and this spot is full, but we do need one spot filled. We actually need like somebody on this special needs team. 
um, uh, and we actually need a woman. So she's like, it's okay, it's okay. I know it's gonna be a really hard spot to fill. You don't have to do it. So then I told her, well, you don't understand. I actually have a degree for special needs. So I really feel like I've got to do this now. Like I need to obey God and, and, and do this. And there's a job for everybody at camp. There's all kinds of positions and we need people in every single position for camp. I've really enjoyed getting to know these little girls um, and, and just being able to teach them and I want to make an impact in their lives. You know, when I was a child, I had I remember people making an impact on, on my life too. And just um, faith, that's all I can say is just, you know, just have faith in God and know that He's going to provide. And just go with an open heart um, and an open mind and um, God can do anything. If you're feeling like you're on the fence, just say yes and God will take care of the rest. Well, good morning, Stonegate. How are you? Hope everyone's well. This is a great looking crowd. I was standing back there and I could hear you worshiping. Y'all sound terrific. Um, I'm going to let that camp video kind of speak for itself. If you have been maybe praying about coming to camp and serving, um, we'd love for you to just take that step. Come to camp with us. Um, we, there's Siggy Camp, of course, and then there's Kids Camp, and we'd love you to be a part of that. If you haven't signed up your kids yet, you still have a little bit of time uh, to do that, so we'd love for your kids to come to camp, too. I'm going to add another camp to our camp, because we can't talk about camp enough around here. So <laughs> this year, we're going to have T-Bar M uh, come to the Midland campus um, and Odessa um, June 24th through June 28th, um, and that is for our second and third graders only. So if you have a second and third grader, we'd love for you to sign them up for that. It'll be here on campus. Um, times are 8.30 to 5, I believe. Um, I'll have to clarify that. Um, but we'd love for them to come to camp. T Bar M comes onto our campus, and we just are the host site. So no servant leaders are needed. I wanted to clarify that. I had some questions in the first service. So my name is Shelly Pearson. I'm part of the Next Gen staff, and we want to welcome you. If you are a first-time guest with us, we want to get connected with you. Stonegate is a pretty big place, and we would love to connect with you in a small way. In the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a um, Start Here card. And we'd love for you to fill that out. Give us a little bit of information so that in the coming week we can get in contact with you, maybe point you in the direction of something you're looking for, um, or answer any questions that you might have. So you can drop that in the offering basket. Um, they're going around. If you missed that, there's a Start Here uh, area out in the foyer. And you can um, just talk with some of the people there and drop that off with them. So thanks for being here. Um, a few announcements, and I have my cheat sheet today. So Stonegate Women is uh, having a Renew conference. It will be a simulcast of Priscilla Shire called Going Beyond. Um, and this is a time for women to come and learn more about God's word and how you can... Um, put that into practical use. It will be at our Odessa campus on April the 6th, and it's 8.30 to 5.30. There will be no child care, so if you're planning to attend that, please make sure you make arrangements for your kiddos. Tickets are $10, and you can register online um, through the Stonegate website. So second one, May 1st, this is a little bit out there, but I want you to have it on your calendars. We are going to have a party at the park. Um, so over at Grande Communication Stadium um, in the pavilion over there, we, um, Colton Dixon is going to be in concert. Uh, we'll have yard games, food trucks. It'll be a great time for families to come and just um, spend some time together, worship together. And our own Stonegate worship team will be opening for Colton Dixon. So whoop, whoop. Uh, so come and enjoy that. Uh, tickets are $5, and kids 5 and under are free, so make sure you bring all the kiddos. And lastly, baptism class um, is next Sunday. That's March 31st, um, so if you've been... Um if you've accepted Christ and want to take that next step of obedience, then we would love for you to be part of that class. Um, typically, the next Sunday is our element service, but for April, we're not going to do that, so listen carefully. <laughs> we will have a, an April 19th, which is a Friday, that's Good Friday, we'll have an element service on that evening. Um, we'll have more details that we'll talk about in the coming weeks, but just kind of note that on your calendar uh, for the 19th of April for an element service on Good Friday. So thanks for being here. I'm going to turn this over to Joe, who's going to do the second part in marriage and divorce in our flourishing series. Thanks for being here. Come 
on now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Welcome, Midland, and those of you that are watching online. Man, it's good to be here. I apologize again. It's taken me so long to get here, but it's really cool what you guys have going on. So uh, it's awesome. So thanks for being here. Today we're going to continue part two of, um, as we're walking through this flourishing series, I started last week, um, two weeks on marriage and divorce. And so if you didn't hear last week for whatever reason, I would highly recommend that, you know, when you go home at some time this week, you, you go back and rewind and listen to section one or, or, or part one, because it will help today make a little more sense, even though I am going to review right, some stuff from last week, but it would really be helpful for you to hear that, and then you'll say, oh, okay, I get where he's going and what he's saying today, unless you just like it in half the story. If you like it in half the story, then it's perfect. You just, you go with it there, but don't write me nasty notes saying, hey, I didn't like that if you didn't hear the first part. So um, anyway, so let's review back a little bit and go from there. So as we've been talking through the series, it, you, whoever, whichever one of us has been speaking, we've been talking about Jesus' desire for us to flourish in our lives. And we've landed on the, a couple of things. And one is that the plan to flourish in our lives that Jesus has um, includes our marriages. But most of the time, this flourishing plan may not look exactly like what we think it might look like. Jesus' plan for flourishing and our plan for flourishing may be different. They may look a little bit different. And we also looked at, we also looked at the idea that this flourishing thing is really an, an issue of the heart. And so it's really all about our hearts. We looked at Matthew 5, and I'm just going to run through, right? We looked at Matthew 5, 31 through 32. And I made a statement based upon what Jesus said about divorce in there, that he seems to be more worried about what's going to happen to the people that are involved in the divorce scenario than he is about it actually being wrong. Or maybe it's only wrong because of what it does to the people involved. Right? Maybe it's only wrong. Maybe he's only saying it's wrong because of all the repercussions and all the things that happen. So then in Matthew 19, we looked at the first part of a segment there, and, it, and Jesus took us back to the original plan. And then we went to Genesis 2 to actually see the original plan, right? Two different beings is, is what God had planned. He had the idea for a man, right, and a woman to come together to create this thing called marriage, this solid piece, two different, two different elements that come together and create this new thing. And then there's the part about when it doesn't go well, how it becomes broken, right, and how we can break it apart. But the idea is that a man and a woman come together to make this solid piece and then sometimes it becomes broken. We realize that even in Adam and Eve's perfect scenario, it didn't go so well. And the reason it didn't go so well is because they have an enemy, right? And the enemy was after them because the enemy hated God, and they were the image bearers of God. So it was his way to get at God was to go through Adam and Eve and to try to hurt them. We also learn that today in the world in which we live that's fallen and broken, we still have the same enemy. And his plan is still the same, to go after us, the image bearers of God, to try to hurt God. And so um, after we looked at that, we, we went on to the idea that we must be proactive. We must be proactive in our marriages for them to work. We looked at the fact that we need to guard our hearts, to be aware that Satan is out there to steal and kill and destroy. We must submit ourselves to God. We must walk in the spirit. We must put our armor on daily for protection. And then we were warned to not allow unforgiveness turn into bitterness. And because we're not supposed to, our root of bitterness, it says in Hebrews 12, it, it, it says it defiles everyone around us. And we looked at the picture of a beach ball, that bitterness is like pushing a beach ball under the water. And you kind of can get it under there for a second. And then it pops up and it splatters on me, and it splatters on everyone that's around me. And then we use the phrase that bitterness is really unforgiveness that's fermented. Bitterness is unforgiveness that's fermented. And then I left you with the seven last pieces 
or points about the idea that marriage is wonderful, it's a gift from God, but it's also incredibly difficult for all of us. To know truth, we must walk with God. Our, marriage has, our marriages have an enemy. We must continue to make time for each other, for fun things. Our choices matter, even the smallest choices in our relationships. Stuff happens in life, things we can't control. And then physical intimacy with each other and only each other is more important than we may think. And so having said all that in review, let's move forward now and pick up in Matthew 19, verses 7 through 9, where we left off as far as the, the scriptures go there. And this is really a continuation of the same conversation that the Pharisees were having with Jesus when they started to, t to test him, really. Hey, what do you say about divorce was really to trick him. But now they come back, and this may be based upon his answer or a legitimate question out of these guys, which doesn't happen that often, right? Just, they always have some underlying thing. But after Jesus said, hey, it wasn't supposed to be this way, and that's why we went back to the original piece, or the original cause, they said to him, then why did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Why is this okay? And Jesus said to them in no uncertain terms, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not been that this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So they're like, again, a legitimate question, I think, what, what, why was it okay? And he says, oh, because your hearts were hard, I had to do something. And Jesus then throws them into the mix of this adultery thing, which seems to be the biggest problem for Jesus. Adultery, right, definition-wise, is a physical relationship between a married person and someone that is not their spouse. And, and that is, the problem with that is that it's the breaking of the covenant. It's the breaking of the oneness. It's the breaking of the plan, the original plan that Jesus had set, or God had said in the garden in place, that this man and this woman would become one and they would become a solid piece. Well, the adultery, it breaks it up. It's no longer a solid piece because there's a breaking of the covenant there. And that's why it's such a big deal. Because sex is more than just sex, right? In, in the world in which we live, it's just, hey, it's just sex. No, in God's economy, it's much more than just that. It's not just a physical relationship. There's so much more that goes with it. In God, God's mind, he likens our marriage, you know, a husband and a wife, to the relationship that he has with us, two different beings becoming one. And so in his context, he calls himself the groom in the scriptures, and his church is the bride. And if you look all the way into Revelation, you find out that one of the first things we do when he settles the score is we have a marriage reception. We have a, we have a, a, a party for the groom and the bride that are coming together. And so he sees this relationship like that relationship. So it's almost like spiritual adultery is like cheating on him when we would worship another God over him. And that's why if he views us this way, that's why it is so incredibly important to him that we're not breaking that covenant. It's very important because it's more than just sex. It's a oneness and a brokenness that happens. And so if we go back to the hardness of heart piece, you know, my first word out of my mouth when I read that was, ouch. Ouch. I mean, that's, wow, okay, because our hearts are hard. He says, I allowed divorce because you're so harsh and rough and difficult and stubborn and stiff-necked. All these words are related and describe what a hard heart is. And so don't check out on me yet, okay? Don't check out on me. So marriage is good. And God has a beautiful plan for it. And divorce is not good because it breaks the covenant. And adultery is not good because it breaks the covenant. And it destroys 
the plan, and it destroys the people that are involved. And if we go back to the beginning, we find out that's what the problem is, is all the hurt and pain that it causes. And that's why Malachi chapter 2, or I like to call him Malachi, is my Italian background, right? He's the Italian prophet. Not really, but it's usually good for at least a chuckle with you guys, but not today. Okay, so Malachi in chapter 2 verse 16 has that famous verse where he says, God hates divorce. And that thing gets thrown around like... Um, I don't know, like it's something we ought to be proud of or something. It's, it's a famous verse. It's thrown around, and it is true. He does hate divorce. But, but it's not like it's, it's not, it should not be thrown around like it's unpardonable or unforgivable. Like that gives you the plague or something like that. That's not God's heart. Because in Proverbs 16, I'll tell you, there's, there's a whole bunch of other things that he says that God hates. There's a whole bunch of other things in verse 16 through 19 God hates. He hates haughty eyes or pride or arrogance. He hates a lying tongue. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates a heart that devises evil plans. He hates feet that run rapidly to evil. He hates a false witness who utters lies. And he hates those who spread strife among brothers. Why does he hate all these things? Again, because they all cause pain to those that he loves. He also hates any worship that's outside of him, Deuteronomy 16. Any worship that is, does not go to him, he hates. And again, the reason why God hates this stuff is because he knows the pain and damage that all these cause, right? Lying causes pain, evil causes pain, all these things. And, and he loves us, and so he is trying to protect us from the pain and the hurt that goes along with these things. No, I hate that because it hurts those that I love. I hate that because it hurts those that I love and does things to those that I love. And so marriage is supposed to be this earthly representation. And so when you break that marriage and that, that covenant, it hurts him, it hurts us. He knows it's going to hurt. I honestly think God hates everything that causes brokenness and pain to his people. And, 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 the, and there's a lot of that out there today in our world. Our world, world is full of things that causes brokenness and pain. The good news is, if you go to the back of the book, you find out that someday all that stuff's going to be gone. Someday the pain and the brokenness and the disease and the heartache and all those things will be wiped away as he sets the stage and he settles his books, however you want to call it. Someday it's all going to be gone away and that should give us some hope. But none of those things that we just talked about, as ugly as they are, or the divorce and all the things that come along with divorce, as ugly as it is, None of it is unpardonable or unforgivable because the blood of Jesus Christ is more than any of those things, right? And Romans 8 tells us there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You've been set free. So no condemnation. It doesn't say there are no consequences, right? There's consequences to anything that we do that goes against God's plan. There's always consequences, but there's no condemnation, and those are two big different things. One is, okay, deal with this, but God loves me. The other one is, okay, I'm going to do this because God hates me. You get it? God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate divorced people. I'll probably say that again in a minute because I said it way before I was supposed to. The consequences that go along with that can surely take the life out of us, though. Right? The consequences sometimes can take any kind of flourishing life and just take it from us. And God's desire is that we live a life 
that is flourishing, that we're not just surviving, but we're thriving and we're flourishing. Now, I know not every divorce in this room or those watching wherever, it wasn't all your fault. You could say, hey, I didn't do that. And so it wasn't my hard heart. And some of you have been through things that have probably been horrible. And, and, and I'm sorry for that. And I don't know your story. But God knows your story. And he's much bigger than I am. Much more able to take care of things. And, um, but even if it wasn't your fault, there's probably hard-heartedness on somewhere in the picture. Somewhere in the picture, because how do we get to the place of having a hard heart anyway? Where does that come from? How do we get there? And, and so I realize that if we live out of the flesh, a lot of this has to do with what we talked about last week. If we live out of the flesh and not out of the spirit, we'll become hard hearted. Because if we live out of God's spirit, he will make us soft hearted people. So if we live out of the flesh, we'll become hard hearted. If we listen and follow other voices, and ideas that are out there, and there's many of them, will become confused and will become hard-hearted. If we fall prey to the enemy and begin to believe his lies and then even agree with his lies and live out of his lies, we'll become angry and we'll become hard-hearted. If we allow that unforgiveness to ferment in, in us and, be, and cause, call, become bitterness will become hard-hearted. And if we've never fully surrendered our hearts to Christ, never really given him our all so that he can take us and actually transform us, we'll become hard-hearted. All of these things, it's not a complete list either, right? I could go on, but I'm not going to. There's so many things that cause hard-heartedness in us. You know, even our past caused hard-heartedness in us sometimes. But what if our hearts were not hard? What, what it might it look like for us to flourish again in a struggling marriage? For that to flourish again. What might it look like for us to flourish again in our lives in a place where we've, we've already been divorced? That's where we find ourselves. What does flourishing life look like after that? And, and so here's my time to say this. Yes, God hates divorce, but God doesn't hate divorced people. God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate divorced people. He hates the pain it causes because he loves people. He loves divorced people. He loves you. He loves me. And sometimes it's hard for me to grasp, but it might be hard for some of you to grasp that he loves you. And even maybe you've been told, oh, you've done this thing, and so God hates you. No, he hates the thing, not you. Again, there's no condemnation. There's consequences, but we're set free in Christ, and his blood covers all of us. We all have issues, right? All I'm trying to do is lay this down and say, I think there's some equality here. There's damage that gets done, absolutely. You, God knows you can't mix two hearts together, make this solid thing, and then break it without having residual damage. And unfortunately, it does go on to the next generation. The statistics show that divorce is one of the greatest, most long-lasting hurts in all the world. And it can go on for many generations unless someone does something about it. Now, I know personally, because I fought long and hard in my life to get through the things that happened to me as a, divorce, as a, as a child of divorce when I was a little kid. And the things that I went through, the issues that I came out of that with have affected my marriage, and they've even affected my children to some extent. There's lots of things that I regret. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood, right, for forgiveness. But I have lots of regrets. And man, I wish I did that different. I wish I still would do that different. I wish I did that different with so-and-so or my, with my kids. 
And a lot of people just say, well, Joe, just get over it. I'm like, it ain't that easy. It's not that easy to get over it. It's just it's something that happens and it hurts inside and it takes time. But, but you know what? We did do something about it in our world. We did do something about it. And even, and even with my struggles and even in the midst of the beauty of my life, the problems that I still have. Okay, so my kids struggle a little because I struggled a lot. But my grandkids, they know nothing. They have no idea what Papa went through. They have no idea what Grandpa went through. Their lives are completely blessed. Because we did something about it along the way. We're just like, ah, we ain't doing this anymore. We're going to fight through because we had everything going against us, so we should be there. And then all the junk that comes in, you have to fight against it. And that's what we talked about last week. So, yeah, divorce is not the end of the world. There can be beauty after it all, but anyone will tell you that's walked through it, there's a lot of ugly, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of suffering that you walk through before you get to anything that even resembles beauty in any way. But we do have beauty. And we do have hope. Because we have a God who's full of grace and mercy and do-overs. He's a God of do-overs. Can I do that over? Absolutely, son. Absolutely, sweetheart. Let's do that over. Let's do that over. Let's start again. Let's walk together and let's do that over. So what if we could be more like him? What if we didn't have hard hearts? What if we were willing to humble ourselves and to walk with God and then begin to walk with our mates in a way that, that, we, that we were able to make some changes? Now, let me make this statement in case I didn't already make this clear. There's no judgment and no guilt And I don't want you to have judgment or guilt about things of the past. In some ways, you didn't know what you didn't know, right? Things happen. You didn't know what you didn't know. That's what it was then. And we're going to only focus on now from this day forward what happens from now on. We leave the past in the past as much as we can, and we move forward. There may be some healing that needs to happen. There may be some apologies that need to happen. There may be some forgiveness that needs to happen. Okay. But not guilt, not judgment, not condemnation. Those are different things. Deal with some stuff, but don't let it weigh you down and make you feel like you're worthless, because that's not true. So I'm hoping part of what happens today is some wake-up calls right in the audience, because there's certainly probably someone or two or three or a hundred that are playing with some fire right now thinking that the grass is greener on the other side, and they're saying, it's too late for us, and and there's no way of turning this around. I'm saying, that's a lie. That's a lie, because I've seen too much. I've been around too long. I've seen too many lives turned around. I've seen too many relationships completely restored, like dead, dead, dead. The only thing they didn't do was bury it, and God has resurrected them. And brought them back to a relationship that you would have no idea that they ever had a problem in their life. God is able to do that. He's able to do that. I've seen so much. But you have to do something about it, right? You have to do, it's not just going to roll in on a tray. And you may or may not understand that aside from the 52 weeks that we have here on Sunday church... There are 46 other annual times for you to get some help for your relationship. Every Tuesday night for 37 weeks out of the year in the Midland campus, there's marriage night. 37 times. There's four love and war marriage retreats that we take couples on every year. One in March and April and September and October. There's three boot camps that we do out of the Midland campus, and all is welcome. We're one church. One of them's for couples. Two of them are just for men because, again, a healthy people make healthy marriages, and unhealthy people make unhealthy marriages. So if your heart can be healthy, we pour into your heart so that you can be better. There's a Mr. and Mrs. Marriage Conference that happens annually, and right now, 
There's a love and war marriage class that's happening right here on campus on Sunday nights. And that doesn't include other men's and women's classes or groups or events or the premarital classes or the, or the counseling that we do. And so I want to say this in the kindest way possible. Don't tell me there's no help. Don't tell me that we're not trying to help, but you have to put in effort also, right? It's your life. It's your deal. You have to make decisions. We're here to do what we can, but we're not going to come out and draw anybody by their hands and just pull them and say, come with me. You have to desire for some help. And on the way out, we're going to give you a bookmark that's going to remind you of all those things I just told you about. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying... There is help available. But to get help, what we've got to do is we just have to humbly get in line. And we just have to say, hey, I need help. Anybody else need help? And all the hands go up. I need help. Well, heck yeah, I need help. We all need help. So it's just humbly getting in line with one another saying, hey, let's get help together. Because again, if you're healthier, you have a better chance of having a healthy marriage. But you just need to start with one step. You can take the broken pieces with a fresh-hearted man and a fresh-hearted woman and put them back together. And you come up with something like this. It's as solid as can be, but it's a little rough. It's got some tough edges here, and it's not exactly going to look like this, but it'll get the job done. There's hope for the future because you can bring this back together. You can have new perspective and new energy and renewed effort. So wherever you are, what I want to show you right now is a personal story. Well, not my personal story, but a story of a couple that was, as we said, probably dead, just not, didn't bury the body yet. And I want you to see how God worked in their lives. And then I'll come back. Um, we were sabotaging ourselves in every way, shape, fashion, or form. So we were horribly unhealthy. Greg was horribly overweight. I was overweight. Um, there, there was a lot of um, drinking. And Kelly was handling the finances. We would try it. I would take it over. Mm-hmm. I'd sit down to pay the bills. I would get extremely upset, um, and it would cause a fight. And it would cause a fight. Big one. And, and eventually, Kelly would find a way to to wrestle control of the finances from me because it kept the peace. I think she felt like she didn't have a choice because if she told me what was going on, we'd have never survived it. Mm-mm. And Kelly was convicted of bank fraud and identity theft. And on June 30th of 2010, we drove in complete silence from Midland to Fort Worth. I dropped Kelly off and she reported uh, to the federal penitentiary at Carswell in Fort Worth where she would stay until February of 2014. We both thought that was it. That was it. We were done. There's no more. I remember I remember um, telling them goodbye and just crying. And I knew, and Peyton, my middle one, said, it's OK. You're going to come home. It'll be OK. And we'll be back the way we were. And I knew that wasn't true. I, I was not engaged or invas- invested in our marriage at all. And she was doing her best to, to hold us together. Uh, from inside of a prison. And I am on the floor, this nasty, godforsaken floor, and I am just crying, and I'm just laying there, broken. And that's when um, the Lord talks to me in really interesting ways. (laughs) But that's when he asked me if I was ready to do it his way, if I was ready to follow him, and that he forgave me, and that he loved me, and that my way was through him. I was asking forgiveness from all the wrong people. I was asking forgiveness from family instead of the one person that once he forgave me, it was over, it was done. 
and I could move on. I was going through a whole different season mm -hmm. than Greg was even remotely close to. Kelly was really working her way towards the Lord and I was running as fast as I could the opposite direction. I think the, the more we went on, the worse he got, the, the more he thought, okay, how am I gonna end this now? Because I would be all excited and he would come and we would just, we'd be broken by the time he left again. But I trusted the Lord and I knew, you know what, I may walk out of here in 2014 and I may not have my husband and I may not have my kids and I'm probably not gonna have my mom and my sister, but I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. It was at that point in my life, it was a sense of obligation. Mm -hmm. She's gonna get out and she'll never be able to take care of herself. Um, you know, I, I can't leave. You know, she couldn't, she had proven over the last uh, 15. 15 years that she couldn't manage her own affairs. Um, and I wasn't gonna leave her to do it on her own. So that's where I was mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally and, and as far as a connection with my wife. It was, it was very cold. It was, you know, looking mm -hmm. back, um, extremely cold time that we did did spend at Stonegate together before she left, um, you know, I, I, I had gotten practiced into studying the Word and, and actually reflecting on it and see what it meant to me. There was a particular verse uh, in the first book of Timothy, chapter 5, verse 8, regarding um, any man that doesn't provide for his family and his household is worse than an unbeliever, is unworthy of me and is worse than an unbeliever. And that would just make me more upset because I thought, I did everything I could. I'm, and this is where my mind was. I'm not the problem. I didn't do this to us. I'm the victim. I remember on January 13th of 2013, waking up in the morning and I thought I was having a heart attack. I was sweating, I was breathing hard. I was, and, and I just said, I can't do this anymore. I, I need you to help me. And I, and I just, I asked God, I said, I need help. This, this isn't working for me. It was the first time I was, I considered the idea that providing for my family um, wasn't just a, a, a monetary thing, a, you know, goods, providing money, shelter, food, clothing. I came to realize that providing for your family meant being the, the spiritual leader of my household being the man of the house that God called me to be. So it's like, it, you know, the Lord just was really stirring and really moving. And uh, Greg came out that next weekend, I had the best visit. I mean, he cried, he apologized. He, he, he read scripture to me. It was, uh, it was huge. And he promised me that day, because we were on the countdown. He were, we were on the countdown. He promised me that day that I would get a piece of mail from him every single day. And from that day forward until the day I left, and on the 21st of February, 14, this man sent me a scripture every single day. This man that wouldn't even talk about God or forgiveness or moving on. Um, and he would say, I don't know how it looks, but I know it looks okay. I don't, I don't know what our future is gonna look like, but I know it's gonna be okay. And we just started planning and we started we started, Greg lost 92 pounds. Um, he started crossfitting. He, he, you know, he started taking care of Greg, not just outside, but inside as well. And it, it, it yeah. stopped, it stopped being Greg in Midland and Kelly in Fort Worth. Yeah. And it started being us marching towards our future after this phase was over yeah. together. We were very guarded when Kelly got home. Um, it was uncomfortable to be around people when Very. Kelly got home. Mm -hmm. um, you feel like you're under a microscope, uh, yeah. the two of us. And I had, I, you know, I was all in at that point. It was us against the world. And if you didn't like it, you know, then we couldn't be friends. We started right we in. Did. Started we right did. in at Stonegate that first Sunday. We did. Back in church, back yep. down in front, right where we belonged. Yep. And, uh, she would have to go, she was on home confinement, so she would have to go into the bookstore and borrow the phone and 
Let and the him, ladies were incredible. Let them know she had shown <laughs> up in church. And before we left, she had to call and let them know she was mm -hmm. leaving church. We get up and work on our marriage every single day too. And and so our kids see that. And, and I love it because um, we have kids that are married with kids. And my daughter, um, she's so wonderful. And she'll say, you know, I, I just, I, you know, I hope I have what you and dad have. And what I want to say is, where were you? <laughs> Don't you remember what we came through? You know, and I'm like, you know what? It, it, it takes work. It takes God. It takes an understanding. Yeah. And and you can't ever stop working on it because we're, we're constantly working on that story. We get asked a lot, um, if you had to do it again and get where, to get where you are right now, would you do it? In a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. If this hadn't happened to us, we wouldn't be together right now. Absolutely not. Where you feel like, I don't wanna get off that concrete floor. I just wanna end this. That is the moment that defines you. That's the moment when the Lord reaches down and lifts you up the most and says, you know what, you're worth it. You're my child and I need you to go and do my work. And I don't know that if I hadn't, if we hadn't gotten to that point, that I would have seen it or I would have stopped and listened because I was just trying to go through life. I was just trying to do my crazy part. How's that statement go? The darkest night comes just before the dawn, right? You just don't know what God has. And so wherever you're at, wherever you find yourself, he is able. He is able, he is stronger, he is willing if you will let him have his way. I know it's not easy, but it's really the only way to do this. It really is. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for uh, today, and I thank you for your love and your care for us. I thank you for your heart for us, and I hope it's so clear that what you are most concerned about is that we live lives according to what you want, that we live lives of flourishing, that our hearts are whole and healthy, and we are protected from the things that hurt us. And so thank you for being that protector and that refuge and being there for us. And wherever we're at, I don't know where we're all at, but you do. And so I ask for you to work in each individual in the way that only you can. And may you do great and mighty things. Jesus, in your name and your power and your authority. Amen.